This video is supported by Brilliant. Earth is the only planet that we know of that has life, especially advanced multicellular life. Whether or not it has intelligent life on it is becoming more questionable every day. And you would think that with life being so rare that Earth would maybe, you know, take better care of it. But actually, Mother Earth has a bad habit of kind of uh, extincting things. That's one bad mama. In the history of life on this planet, there have been five major extinction events, most of them caused by some kind of asteroid strike. Many say that we're going through a sixth one right now, caused by us. Humans, the Miley Cyrus of species. The references in this channel, super recent. So if we want to survive ourselves, we're gonna need a second place to call home. And while there are some options here in our solar system, they're fixer-uppers to say the least. Luckily, we're finding new exoplanets all the time. Like, like it doesn't even make news anymore when we find an exoplanet, unless it's super Earth-like. And we have found some Earth-like planets out there in the vastness of space. Whether or not we would ever actually be able to get to them, that's another question. The fastest object humanity has ever launched into space is the Juno probe, which did an elliptical orbit around Jupiter, gaining speed each time and eventually reaching a mind-blowing 165,000 miles an hour. And in 2025, the Parker Solar Probe is expected to blow past that, eventually reaching 430,000 miles an hour. If you were on a plane going that speed from New York to LA, it would take 23 seconds. Theoretically, you actually would never get there. You would vaporize immediately with the force of a two megaton bomb. It would wipe out everything in a five mile radius in one of the most densely populated centers in the world. It would kill millions of people. And here's the thing, that's only 0.064% the speed of light. The closest star to us is 4.3 light years away. It would take 6,711 years to get there at that speed. Damn space, why you gotta be so big? Just wanna see things. Suffice it to say, it's, it's gonna be a minute before we have the technology to get to a place like that. We don't have any hyperdrives or warp drives or slipstreams or wormholes, no going plaid for the Expanse fans out there, no Epstein drive. That's a name that didn't age well. So the obvious question becomes, why even look for these exoplanets if there's no chance that we would ever actually get there? My first thought is, you never know. We might eventually develop the technology to go faster than light. But the second thing is, Finding life on another planet in the universe would be the biggest discovery in the history of our species. It would completely make us rethink everything about our place in the universe. As long as there's a question mark on whether or not there's life in the universe, we will continue to fill that gap with the belief that we're special in some way and this whole thing was made for us or that we're living in a simulation or something like that. And yeah, finding out that we're not really special might be a bummer, but the flip side is that also means that we're part of something bigger much bigger. So yes, we search for life on other planets. And because we only know of one kind of life, we look for planets that are as close to the type of planet that created that life as possible. And to do so, scientists have gotten super nerdy about it. Enter the Earth's Similarity Index. This is actually a thing. The ESI is a mathematical model determining how closely a planet resembles planet Earth, with one being completely Earth-like. So we're trying to find a planet as close to one as possible. Mars, for example, is considered to be an ESI of 0.697. Not good, not terrible. But still, no life on it. At least, no life we've been able to find. And it's not for lack of trying. The number one feature we're looking for here is size. A rocky planet roughly the size of Earth would probably have a similar atmosphere, similar composition, lots of things. And there's actually an easy equation to determine a planet's ESI value when it comes to size. It looks like this. Yes, this is actually known as the easy index because, I mean, look at it. It's it's, it's, it's so simple. So in 2007, some astronomers applied this formula to the planets and the, the large bodies in our solar system, large bodies being anything with a, a radius of 100 kilometers, and they picked 47 of them. And they applied this formula to the known exoplanets at the time, which is 258, which is adorable because there's well over 4,000 now. And they plotted the distribution of planets across the ESI index, and they got a chart that looks like this. So the yellow on this chart is the predicted percentage, the orange one is for the planets in our solar system, and the blue line is for the exoplanets that were discovered by 2007. 
And as you can see, the number of exoplanets drops precipitously as you get closer to one. Although I'm gonna say it, I do have a problem with this graph because it was done in 2007 and there was such a small number of exoplanets that we had discovered at that time. And earlier on, most of the planets that we were finding were large, you know, super Jupiters that, you know, we've only recently been able to start finding the smaller rocky planets. So I think a current version of this would look quite a bit different. Or not, I don't know. I don't trust it, but I couldn't find a newer graph than this. So then why even show us this, Joe? Well, I don't know, except to maybe just make the point that people are looking at it like this. But still, even if it is right, and there's only, what, like 4% of planets out there that are, you know, in the higher tier of the ESI index, that's still a lot of potentially habitable planets out there. Using Kepler Space Telescope data, scientists have assumed that there's around 50 billion planets in our galaxy, with about 500 million of them in the habitable zone of their stars. That's 20 million potential cradles of life. Of course, that's just taking size into account. There's a lot of other variables that you have to consider. And as for how we find these planets, the two most popular ways of doing it are the radial velocity method and the transit photometry method, which I've talked about before, so I'm not really gonna go into detail on that, but there are several other ways of doing it, which I'm not gonna go down that rabbit hole. You guys can go look it up yourself. I'll put a link down in the description if you wanna know more, but there's many different ways that we have gone about finding planets over time. But moving on, since scientists have gotten so nerdy about how to classify these planets, it only makes sense that they would have all that together in a catalog somewhere, which they do. It's called the Habitable Exoplanets Catalog. And the exoplanets here are categorized into three groups based on size. Subterran, which is smaller than Earth, something like Mars. Terran, which is very Earth-like. And Superterran, which are basically super-Earths that can be up to 2.5 times the radius of the Earth and 10 times the Earth's mass. There are some planets out there beyond the size of super-Earths, like this beefy boy, which has more than nine times the mass of Jupiter. Obviously, something like that would not make its way into the habitable exoplanets catalog, but for the ones that do, they meet a very strict criteria. Be roughly the size of Earth, be near a bright and stable star, have a rocky composition but with some water features, a warm planet that's in the range of 255 Kelvin, a planet with an average radius, which means it's spherical, and an exoplanet that isn't too far away. So now that we've explained what qualifies a planet to be Earth-like, let's look at a few standout examples, shall we? First on the list is Tea Garden B. Tea Garden B was found just last year in June 2019, and it's 12 light years away orbiting an inactive M-type red dwarf star that's around 8 billion years old. The fact that it's an inactive red dwarf star is good because the active ones tend to kind of rip away atmospheres. It's really close to the same size as Earth at 1.05 Earth masses, and it's really close in temperature at 267 Kelvin. Earth's average temperature is 288 Kelvin. But it orbits way closer to its star with only a five-day orbital period, meaning its year lasts five days. And the star emits primarily infrared light, so life on this planet would be very different, especially plant life. But all in all, it scores a 0.93 on the ESI index and has about a 60% chance of having similar conditions to Earth. And it's only 12 light years away, so in cosmic terms, not too bad. So maybe someday you'll be able to have tea on Tea Garden. I'm kidding, that's never gonna happen. But hey, if you're not into that Tea Garden life, you might like K272e. And no, that's not the name of Elon Musk's next child. K272e is actually considered a super-Earth at 2.21 Earth masses. It was found in 2016 orbiting around an M-type star and has a 24.2 day orbit, making their year about a month long for us. And it orbits really close to the star, only one-tenth as far away as we are from the sun. Which would create some spectacular sunrises, except for the fact that it's probably an eyeball planet. It's tidally locked with its star, so you would never actually see the sunrise. I've done a whole video on eyeball planets. They're super interesting. I'll link it down below. But if you would like to get close to K272e, you might want to leave early because it's 227 light years away. GJ3323b was found by the HARPS telescope in 2017. It's a rocky world with 2.02 times the mass on Earth, which means that Sylvester Stallone is twice as big there. Get it? Because rocky? <laughs> so funny. The downside to this one is that we don't think it has any water on it. And we uh, don't really know that much else about it. It's, it's, it's an Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone of its star, and that's, that's, that's about it. I'm sure there'll be more info coming in on it as we examine it in the future. And that brings us to one of our favorites, the TRAPPIST system. This is another one I've covered many times on this channel before, but the TRAPPIST-1 system is a system of seven planets that are all Earth-like, and three of them are in the habitable zone of its star. But the most promising one, probably, is TRAPPIST-1d. It's a little bit smaller than Earth at 0.41 Earth mass, so you'll feel a little lighter on your feet. It won't be that hard to explore the entire planet. What you will find, again, is a tidally locked planet, meaning one side of the planet will face the star at all times. In other words... <laughs> 
And the cool thing is, like I said, there's a couple of other planets that are in the habitable zone of that star. Uh, they're not quite as promising as TRAPPIST-1D, but they're interesting as well. But if you wanted to get there, you might want to get a move on. It is about 40 light years away. And last but not least is another planet that we don't know a whole lot about, but it does rank really high in the ESI index, and that's GJ1061C. This planet has a mass of 1.74 Earths, so a little on the chonky side. It also orbits an M-type star, but it's pretty close with an orbital period of only 6.7 days. And this is easily the newest planet that's on this list. It was just found earlier this year. Now you might notice that none of these are perfect, and there's some really short orbital periods, meaning these are planets that are really close to their stars. Now there's a lot of reasons for this. One is that if we're looking for Earth-sized planets and we're trying to find them based on how they're affecting their stars, then it's the planets that are really close to their stars that are going to affect them the most. And also with the transit method, you have to watch the star for long enough to see the planet go across it. So if somebody was watching us, they would have to wait for a whole year. Now, if we're looking out there and there's planets that are crossing every few days or every few weeks, that's just more opportunities to see it happen. And that's just what we're going to wind up with with the current technology that we use to detect them but that technology is changing. We all know about the James Webb Space Telescope and how that's gonna open up the universe to us, but NASA's working on a lot more than that. The Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, previously known as WFIRST, it got a new name earlier this year, should go up in 2025 and will be a huge leap forward in exoplanet discovery. Because not only will it be able to view with the same clarity as Hubble, it'll be able to do so over a hundred times larger area, and it'll have a coronagraph on board to directly image planets around distant stars. This will complement JWST and the TESS satellite to give us more eyes on exoplanets than ever before. And beyond the Roman telescope, NASA's been working on a concept called LUVAR, the Large UV Optical IR Telescope. This wouldn't go up for 10 to 15 years after the Roman telescope, but this is basically JWST on steroids. This is still in development, so there's still a lot of speculation here, but the mirror on LUVAR is expected to be between 8 and 15 meters. JWST is 6.5 meters. The abilities of this telescope are enormous, from seeing the earliest moments of our universe to galaxy formation, even planet formation, and it's going to open up a whole new category of exoplanet detection. Another NASA project on the horizon is called HabX, and it's specifically designed to directly image Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars. HabX's main goal is to not just directly image Earth-sized exoplanets, but also determine the composition of their atmospheres. It'll do this by measuring the spectra of the light coming off of the atmospheres and look for signs of life like oxygen or ozone. And looking as far out as 2050, NASA has something called the ExoEarth Interferometer Telescope. This is a whole new way of detecting exoplanets. Interferometers are devices that split light waves and then use the alignment or misalignment of the light waves when they come back together again to measure things to nanometer accuracy. The LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave detectors are good examples of this. Well, the ExoEarth interferometer would use that same idea across either a couple or an array of telescopes to image things to a greater detail than, say, an optical telescope could. This is known as angular resolution. And I would explain the details of how this works, but I can't do it. I'm not that smart. But if this works, an array like this would not only be able to directly image exoplanets and ascertain what's in their atmospheres, you might actually be able to map the planet's surface. So yeah, in the next 50 years, we're going to be getting closer to exoplanets than ever before. Even if we can't quite actually get close to them. It's really amazing what scientists have been able to think up when it comes to, you know, visualizing and resolving images from the outer universe. And if you want to get an idea of the whole history of astronomy and how it all works, I can definitely recommend the astronomy course. I'm brilliant. Over 30 interactive quizzes and more than 300 exercises, you'll learn everything you ever wanted to know about the cosmos, including black holes, dark matter, Hubble's law, black body radiation, and much more. And once you've absorbed all that, you can move on to some of the other courses on Brilliant, like the classical physics course, the quantum mechanics courses, applied science, computer algorithms, even competitive math. And the thing that's so great about Brilliant is that you learn things by solving problems. This wires your brain to think like a scientist and, and superpowers your problem solving abilities that can pay off in every area of your life. Plus, you can do it on your mobile device, even offline, so you can take it with you wherever you go. And they've got these daily challenges, so if you just want a little brain nugget every day to just kind of keep you sharp, it's a great way to spend 10 minutes or so. But if you want to get a taste of what I'm talking about, they do have free daily uh, brain teasers and whatnot. And if you want to take just the first section of any of these courses, like any of them on their platform, you can do that. Try it out for free. But if you do sign up for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses and you're one of the first 200 people to do so, you can save 20% by going to brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. So yeah, give it a try. It's a lot of fun. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Link is down in the description.
Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon that are keeping things going, forming an awesome community, and actually starting to help me out with fact checking and stuff for the video. So I really do appreciate that. Uh, there's some new people. I gotta murder their names real quick. We got KM Asano, Elisa Sandul, Christopher Chapman, Steve, Ronald Kemp, uh, Sir Mansky, Richard Margolin, Craig Chaplain, Michael Gatewood, John Bird, Mark Boyce, Derek Borigo, Robert Solomon, Ithalin, Nico Efferth, <laughs> Yell Sleggers, welcome back, sir, uh, Kimberly Petri, A.W. Parker, and Mitchell Rotes. I think I said that right. Thank you guys so much for signing up. Uh, if you would like to join them, get early access to videos and exclusive content that other people don't get to see, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. As always, t-shirts are available at the store at answerswithjoe.com slash store. Lots of fun, nerdy stuff. There is some new stuff on the way, so you wanna, might want to go check it out. There's also mugs, hoodies, all kinds of stuff. It's not just shirts. Anyway, go check it out. It's fun. It supports the channel. I do appreciate it. Answerswithjoe.com slash store. Merchandising. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like this one, so you might want to check that one out. Any of the others that might have a face on the side. And if you do like them and you enjoy them, you want to see more, I invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. Thank you guys for watching. Go out and have an eye-opening week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.